Well, greetings and good day. This is Christopher Fries here at Fries Forge. Today we're going to take a look at how I did and how you can forge a Jormungandr shelving bracket just like this one. If you'd like to see just how we forged that, good news. I'm going to make this kind of an instructional video. See if you can't follow along at home, make one of your own. Let's do that. step in making our Jormungandr shelving bracket is to address the tail. I'm going to start at the back end first. One of the things that I noticed about the first one that I made is that the tail could have used much improvement. So with that in mind, I'm attempting to forge these corners in so that way we can make one smooth taper from the body to the tail. It can be a little tricky to get your hammer right into where the transition needs to be. So using the edge of the anvil, we can upset it. After we've upset it a little bit, turn it back onto its side, and slowly trying to bring the rather sharp corner to a more smooth transition. Those initial few heats are sort of to build up the mass a little bit, so that way we can really actually forge it without having the whole thing kind of taco shell on itself. Now you can start to see the increasing cross-section from forging in of the corners. We'll use this material to help with the transition into the very tip of the tail. that we have the material from the sides kind of pushed more towards the middle and those corners forged in, we can begin to create the taper and draw this out. If you think about the steel in three-dimensional space, we're, we're kind of squishing from the outside towards the inside, which kind of causes it to bulge up along the outside, but that's okay because when we forge it out laterally when we draw it out, that'll move that bulge laterally as opposed to outward, effectively making it narrower and longer.
we have a nice transition from the body to the tail, it's time to start making this snake round. Before we were trying to make sure that the material didn't fold over on itself. Now we're trying to do almost exactly that, but in a more controlled fashion. I'm using a bottom swage to start this, but I could have easily started with the step of the anvil. The step of the anvil may have actually been preferable to this bottom swage, because if you'll notice, it leaves marks on what will be the outside of the snake. Working from the tail towards the head, we want to set this beginning of a round snake all the way up to where the head will be. We don't want it fully round yet. We still have to isolate the head. It's difficult to see because of the framing and the contrast in the video, but the tool that I'm using here is a blacksmith's magician, and it is, well, freaking magic. This one is made by Ozo Tools. There's a link in the description of the video if you want one for yourself. I highly recommend it. An alternative to using the blacksmith's magician here in this way would be to use the edge of the anvil and a cross peen hammer. It's not going to make it nearly as precise or clean, but it would do the trick. Now that I have the head effectively isolated, I can go back to beginning the rounding of the snake body in the section that I wasn't able to do before. Now that we have the rounding started on the entirety of the body, it's time to actually begin the rounding. With a light to medium blow, we're putting one edge of the bottom of the snake on the anvil, and the other edge we're hitting with the hammer, and that begins to create the round shape. Make sure that you do both sides evenly, or you'll end up with some twisting, as you can see. In order to correct the twisting, you simply go to your vise with it hot, and give it a little twist in the vise. Apparently I lost that footage. The way the steel looks here, kind of half folded, half open, almost reminds me of a bean pod. If you ever wanted to make a bean pod, this might be how you would go about it. trying to use the step of my anvil and the toe of my hammer in order to close up the tail and really start getting everything all good and round, but my hammer is just a little bit too big and the spot I'm trying to hit is just a little too small, so I move a little further up the snake and I'll have to come back with a cross peen and address that. If I really wanted to preserve the scales, even more so than I have, I might want to consider doing this on top of wood. That way the bottom side, the part where the scales are that's contacting the anvil, will instead be contacting wood and thus won't be forged by the anvil. Now you can see what I was talking about before with the toe of my hammer just being too big for this job. There are no scales on this little tang section, so I don't have to worry about marring them up. So I'm really just trying to fold this over, and this will really be the first thing that I bring to round. My larger rounding hammer is just too big for this little section, so we're moving down in the hammer size to our two pound Nordic Forge Farrier's rounding hammer. Much like the tail, we have some changing of cross section to do here on the head. In order to make sure that this thing doesn't just taco over, we're forging in on the sides a little bit so that we can give the little bit of strength that's going to be needed for the middle so that it doesn't fold over as much as it would want to do otherwise. 
now that we have that little bit of extra mass and strength to the steel, we can go and very carefully set down on what will be the, I guess, the beginnings of the mouth. This is essentially the technique that you would be using with the cross peen hammer if you were trying to isolate the head, as I mentioned earlier when I was using my blacksmith's magician from Ozo Tools. One problem you can see I have here by forging in this way is that the sides of my snake's mouth end up being uneven. So the side that was under the anvil ends up being a little different than the side that was being struck by the hammer. And then I flip the head around and try again from the other side to try and match everything all up. I end up getting it eventually in the next heat, but it's very finicky. As I'm forging the head of the world snake, you'll notice that there's a slight buildup along the edges of the side of his mouth. This is intentional. I want material underneath, but not on top. And so I'm trying to make sure that that is the case. We end up achieving that, and you'll see that I end up using that mass in order to try to cut fangs into the mouth of the snake. It doesn't go exactly as I have planned, but you can see my thought process. You have to be careful here not to cut it too sharp of an angle, of which I almost do. Hot cutting is very effective, and if you're not careful, you could cut right through to the other side. That's definitely not what we want. I want to cut from the back of the material that I've built up and cut underneath it so that way I can kind of fold it out and then have a fang. It, it sort of works the way I have envisioned, but not really. I was trying to get myself some nice curly looking gnarly fangs, but I kind of mess with it too much, and, or, or not enough, I'm not sure. But I end up with these kind of nubs. All that time spent making failed fangs has left my snake's head in a very contorted way. So we need to, we need to bend that back the way that I want it. Point of note here, I'm actually holding the fangs over top of the edge, so that way they don't get forged in. Good thing to try to remember. A wooden mallet helps make sure that the, the head doesn't get forged, it just gets bent. I'm using a ball punch here. We call it a ball punch because the very end of the punch is round, like it would be in a ball. Crazy, right? My biggest mistake here was leaving the head unsupported. So as I'm trying to forge these eye sockets in, I'm also bending the material quite a bit as well. It's less than ideal. You can see here I brought the snake back just a little bit in the vise, and so it's supported much better than it was before, and as a result, I'm able to forge in those eye sockets with far less trouble. We're finally busting out the wood. I wouldn't want to accidentally forge those nice eye sockets that I've just spent so long punching in, and so the wood works very well for that. Now that we have the head nice and flat, we want to make it so that it is not. We're forging an animal here, and an animal is three-dimensional, not two-dimensional, so we want to give it a little bit of depth. And we'll do that by dishing out from the underside. You need to be very precise with your blows here. One missed strike and you could flatten your tooth or kink your neck. No matter what it is. Uh, if it, 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 a missed strike is not good at right now. If you don't have a 2x4 to put in your vise, you could also just use a stump. Uh, a wooden stump works just fine for this. Uh, dishing is basically the same technique as I would use if I were making a spoon. This serpent needs to be not straight. I'm using an old Ford wrench that I've turned into a bending wrench in the bending fork on the heel of my anvil to give this snake a little bit of a sideways motion, to sideways bend to make it look like it's in motion. That bending opened up the underside of the snake a little bit, so we're just addressing that to make sure that it doesn't become a problem in future. I 
You have to be very careful here to make sure that you don't collapse your circle that you've made. Remember, this snake is hollow on the inside. If we're too aggressive with our bending, we risk collapsing the whole thing. And then, good luck trying to fix that from the inside out. Keeping everything straight that's supposed to be straight is a really good idea. Anytime you see something getting out of whack, whack it back in a line. It seems I've lost a little bit of footage where I made this 90 degree bend. It's too bad because a lot of people have trouble with this part. I know I sure have in the past. Just like the head when we bent it over the 90 degrees, it caused the underside of it to open up a little bit. So we go back in with the hammer, close everything all back up and getting it ready for the next step should be getting it to a perfect 90 and making sure that tail is nice and flat so it holds the board well. Chris, you've got a wooden mallet. Use the wooden mallet. Good job. One mistake that I notice I've made here is I did not make it perfectly straight left to right. I'm trying for being straight across the board but this should be also straight out from the wall if that makes sense now is time to create the backing plate that will attach your mangandra to the wall i'm starting with some hot rolled one centimeter square mild steel this works very well not only is it easy to forge, it's also easy to drill through later. It's also my hope that this will make the welding of the backing plate to Jormungandr a little easier. Jormungandr is high carbon steel, this is mild steel. And I know when you're forge welding, mild steel to high carbon steel is very good, works very well. High carbon steel to high carbon steel doesn't, not nearly as well. As we hot cut this, take note the order of operations. Your first blow, roll to the side. Second blow, roll back from the first blow to the other side. Third blow, turn it all the way around. Match the two marks that you, as you can see them, and then strike there for your fourth blow. Now you've created a perfect circle around this square, and you can hot cut it off more effectively. This backing plate needs to be an exact mirror of the snake so that where the snake is not, holes can be so that it can be affixed to the wall. But you don't have to make it an exact mirror. All you have to do is make it the same as the snake is and then flip the piece over. I like how everything is all lining up. There's one thing that we still need, and that's a little bit of support for the head. As small a gap as possible here, this is offering support for the head. And so, in order to get as close as we possibly can, we've almost overforged the height of the snake head support, and then we can go ahead and hot fit it. Now that we have that, we're ready to weld. Now that we have the snake tack welded down onto the backing plate, I want to prevent any further splatter from affixing itself to either my metal welding table here or anywhere else on the snake. So we're using the sooty acetylene flame in order to create kind of a, almost like a barrier. It creates kind of like a dust. And then the, the weld kind of skips off that and doesn't stick to it nearly as much as it would have normally. This is quite an effective technique. I'll be using it again in future. I'd like to thank Fofo for suggesting it three weeks ago on my last shelving bracket video. Allow me to illustrate just how effective this is. See how easily I can move my scraper along on the sooty area, but not so much on the area that's not covered in soot. Look how far that splatter goes. What a massive, massive difference that sooty acetylene has made. Now 
you can see how well it protected the splatter from the snake itself as well. A few pieces land on it, but not nearly what would have. Well, there we are. My Jormungandr shelving brackets are all complete. I'm so glad that I took the time to learn my mistakes on the first one before filming this video for you. And I certainly did learn quite a bit. I hope that I've conveyed all of that to you in the creation of this one. And hopefully you're able to learn from my example and go out to forge a better one of your own. Well, you may have noticed at the beginning of the video, or you may not have, that I'm actually wearing my first bit of Freeze Forge merch, merchandise. I made that t-shirt on Printful. You can find a link to it in my Etsy store. You can purchase one on there if you like. That is the very first and the very last bit of merch that's going to be coming from me through Printful. I have already uploaded several designs to my Teespring account, which you'll find linked in the description, of which are really going to be ending up a lot better than they could have been on Printful. Very happy for the suggestions to try out Teespring. Thank you very much, guys. I completely agree. I was totally off my rocker to go tr even try with Printful, because Teespring does the same thing, only better with faster and simpler tools. So. Oh, and also at a cheaper price. Uh, the printful shipping is pretty high, but Teespring shipping is far lower. So I'm able to provide the shirt to you at a much better price than I would be able to do through Printful. But if you want the very first piece of Freeze Forge merchandise, because who doesn't want to have the first thing ever, you can find that on my Etsy store for a limited time. If shirts aren't your thing, good news. I've also got some stickers in there and we'll be uploading new shirts, new designs, new things to there all of the time. I'll keep you informed of that. If you'd like to have your part in keeping these videos coming, you can do that. All the links for everything are in the description. And if you don't want to do that, that's, that's totally fine. I, I absolutely understand. I kind of feel like a, I don't know, some sort of shill whenever I, I mention anything to do with Teespring or, or, or shirts or money or Patreon or anything like that. I, I'm not doing this for the money. Uh, if I was, I would be broke. Uh, I have a job, <laughs> so that's my main source of income, but it just helps make sure that I can continue to make videos, because if I can't buy steel, I can't forge it. So if you want to help out the channel, make more videos, make better videos, things like lighting are really awesome. They really help make better videos for you. Uh, if you like the lighting in here, let me know. I've kind of got it set up so that my bright is over here and kind of trying to create like a contrast thing. I don't know. I'm always playing and trying out new ideas. Anyway, I'm rambling on here. Long story short, if you want to help out, fantastic. That's great. If you don't, no worries. I understand. Another goddamn YouTuber trying to get money out of me. Fuck you. None of that. We don't need it. That's not what this is about, not even a tiny little bit. But I have some wonderful news. I applied for a new position, the company that I currently work for. So I used to run the train sometimes as a conductor and I would run a forklift or a lift truck loading ships or barges or stuff like that. I've accepted a new position within the same company 
that's going to allow me to have instead of a four on, four off, 12 hour, 12 hour, day shift, night shift kind of schedule, which is really bad for your body and not so good for the old depression. I have been accepted for a new position. So I'm gonna be driving a loader and a dump truck, but I'm gonna be on day shift, which is awesome. So it means that I'm gonna be working Monday to Thursday or Wednesday to Saturday. I don't know which, which one I've, I'm, I'm gonna be in yet. It's all yet to be seen. But what this means is I'm gonna be able to have consistent video uploads and consistent live streams. So this is what I need from you. I'm designing and, 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 and getting everything all ready now. Once I get transferred, we're gonna be jumping right in and we're gonna start this new schedule that I'm currently devising. So I need some information from you. I want to know what time zone you are in and what time and what day works best for you to be able to attend and view a live stream, hopefully participate in, comment, talk, stuff like that. I'll be able to work my schedule to work best with the most number of people and then we can get some really great live streams going every single week and consistent video uploads as well. No more working six night shifts in a row at 12 hour shifts and then being a zombie for my last day off or two days off and then being right back to work on the day shift for a couple of days and then right back onto the night shifts because right now I'm not the most senior person and any overtime that comes to me is usually a night shift. I'm so done with night shifts. So I got a new position. I, I got a posting for a day shift and I am so excited for the new schedule that's gonna be coming up. It's gonna be really helpful for the old depression, which the battle, I might add, is going very well. The downward spiral has ceased and the slow climb back up going very, very well. And every day gets a little easier than the day before until it gets harder, but then it gets easier again. So it's kind of a, you know, imagine a bar graph. You go, good, 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 good. Ah, how we had a bad day. Oh, we got even better now. A couple of good days. Oh, we had a bad day. It just keeps kind of going like that. It just needs to be jigsawing up. Today's been a great day. Rhiannon hasn't been here at all. And usually when she, Rhiannon's off at work, I'm pretty sad and depressed but not today. We're making improvement every single day. Thank you all very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you all in the live streams and I look very forward to the end of night shifts. May the force serve you well.